All right, it doesn't say that I interrupted it, so we're gonna do it that way. All right, thank you to everybody for joining us this evening. Let's go ahead and get this started. My name is Bethany Pearson. I am the program and volunteer coordinator for the Everett Rail Marshfield Public Library. And we are so happy to have you joining us this evening for our family history talks. And tonight we are welcoming Lori Bessler, reference librarian, to go ahead and share online family trees with us. Uh, I am going to just let you know that if you are noticing any technical issues, whether that's sound, something is freezing, anything along those lines, please use the chat feature at the bottom of the screen to let me know. I am going to be lurking quietly in case we have any of those issues so that I can then handle those as they come up. But if you have any questions specifically related to our presentation for this evening that we will ask Lori, please use the, the Q&A feature, which is also located at the bottom of the screen. The Q&A feature is very handy for us to put those questions all in one place instead of getting lost in any other conversation or in answers and then we are able to answer those in a timely fashion when we get to them. Uh, we will probably be waiting until the end of the program but I don't want you to forget your questions when you have them so go ahead and put them in right away and we will answer them when we have the opportunity. But I think that's all I have to say right now. I'm going to go ahead and hand everything over to Lori and let her get started. Well, it's a joy to be here tonight with you all. Online family trees is a very hot topic, has been for a while. So um, there's a lot to be, to be uh, told tonight. So let's move along. So what is an online family tree? I think it's important to really step back and really understand what are we exactly talking about tonight? So websites that present your genealogy. Genealogy are the names, dates, and places. It's the raw data. Um, on pedigree charts and family group sheets, but these are also websites that present your family history, the actual stories as you design them. So you can do use some of these websites to create books and, and um, more uh, developed websites about the family stories. So I am not presenting on each and every one of the websites that are out there. There are hundreds of sites that you could do this kind of um, project on. So, and I'm also not talking about Family Tree Maker, Roots Magic, Legacy, uh, Reunion, any of those software programs. We will not be talking about those tonight. Um, I mentioned them a little bit, but not very much at all. So, and we're not discussing the collections that are found on these sites that hold family trees. So you're going to ignore those, those hint leaves <laughs> that show up on Ancestry or the hints that show up on um, all the other different types of websites. So we're not focusing on the actual collections and just on the online tree. So who uses these sites? Mostly it's researchers. And the idea, the, um, one of the things that are out there is that it's not always someone who's related to you. Some of the people out there are hosting on behalf of other people. And so the contact you make might end up being a neighbor or a friend who has posted some of this information on behalf of a, of a friend of theirs. Um, it's a variety of people from a various income. So, it's really important to understand, you don't wanna post your tree, if you're gonna do this, post it on trees that are making those trees free for the public to find. Um, so that's really important to be able to um, let all, all variety of incomes have access to the information you're providing. There is always a risk of identity theft. And so you're, not, you're gonna try not to list living people. You're gonna read the, um, the criteria or the, the uh, the now I'm going to come up run out of words here the st standards whatever the site has put into their criteria as to how they follow um, the rules and make sure that your information is protected so it's important to read those so why do we do this um, a lot of times it's to find lost relatives and new friends researchers with the same goals as yours and access to resources they may have easy access to but you have not been able to get access to <clears throat> so it's also to find collections that people have posted not those collections put on there by the, the managers of the websites but things that people have actually attached to the various profile pages of the ancestors these could be including photos documents stories other things like that it's also to share your research and to share your collections so it's it's really up to you how far you want to go with this it's not required that you put a bunch of stuff on there um, you really have to determine wh what 
what's your goal in putting your answer, your uh, research into a family tree online? Understand when it's out there, it's it's out there for good. So that's that's something to consider. I also do make sure that I, I point out to people, you really have to think about whether you should actually have this as a storage place of collections or data. Um, when I mention a storage place, what I mean is that you don't want to po post all of your research on a website and depend on that website and keep paying that website to upgrade or to um, hold on to all that, that research. Instead, Family Tree software and your external hard drives or your hard drives on your computers, those are good places to keep track of all of the research you've done. Using the online trees should be a fishing trip. All right, it's not to be the only place where you store the information. When should you use these sites? I think this is a really important point to make. A lot of times this, this box <laughs> that we're all looking at right now, the computer, is very exciting. There's a lot to be found. There, it's, you know, you move on to the next generation, the next one, the next, and pretty much you're snowballing after a little while and you're gathering everything you can. What you want to do before you even start looking for those trees and if you have been looking at trees, step back and, and ask yourself, have you done enough on your own direct ancestors to be able to look for research that other people have put together? So first you should have already done the basic research on your family. And this means looking at all your home archives, make sure you understand what you have. Um, have you found all the family members in the censuses? All right, obituaries on each of the per people in the, the um, on your family tree. Their vital records, meaning their birth, marriage, and death events on either civil records or on church records. Understanding more about these types of records will help prevent you from running down that rabbit hole. And we've all gone down the rabbit hole that we have. There's a lot of ways that we've gotten lost and then we've gathered information that is wrong information, it's going down the wrong line, gone gone down the wrong tree or up the wrong tree. And so this organizing before you actually start looking is really important. So you've organized what you know, and now you have a list of what you need to find. You go into the hunt better equipped. That's the key. Only then do you go to the sites to break through those brick walls. You have enough ammunition, <laughs> you have enough information to say, okay, that Joseph that shows up on that tree, that looks promising because he does have a wife named so-and-so and that matches my person. He did have a son by the name of this who was born in this time period at that place. And so you have more, to, more ammunition to go into that search. Um, also, you're only then you're going to go to find other family members because they're going to come back to you with questions saying, well, what have you found on the family? And you don't want to be like, oh, I, I don't remember what I have. <laughs> that never sounds good. Um, and then, of course, to share your research. You want to be organized enough to do that because, like I said, those family members, they're going to say, hey, I saw that you had this tree on this website and I, I'd like to know if you have any more information and you want to be prepared for that. How do you add your tree to these online sites? <clears throat> you upload GEDCOM files from your family tree software. So if you use Roots Magic, for instance, you can export a copy of your tree. It creates what's called a GEDCOM file, genealogical data communications file. You take that file and you upload it to or import it to a website that hosts family trees. And that way all of your data is moved along with that, along with things like notes and other parts of your family tree software program. Another way is to enter information directly onto the website tree. And so that's done as well. Some people prefer to do that because then that forces them to look at one person at a time. And so many times uh, as I'm teaching classes, I'm trying to get people to slow down slow down and really look at each person separately instead of, hey, I just grabbed another 50 people off of this other tree. Unless you really understand who those people are and where that information came from, it's not worth grabbing. <laughs> you have to understand it. As a general rule, women are listed under maiden names. And so you have to keep track of that as you go. Many times that I've run across trees, people are putting their married name onto that person's profile page. And as a standard, that's usually not, um, not looked upon very well. So it's best to keep them under their maiden name. 
surnames can be complex. <clears throat> An example on my Norwegian line and my Danish line too, there's a farm name and there's a patronymic name. And so I have to admit, I, got, I have to look into this a little more, more deeply um, to figure out what is the proper name to put in. If it's patronymic, then the, the na surname of the children of that person may end up being different. And so that's important to make, make use of um, organizations like the, uh, the Norwegian American Genealogical Center in Naseth Library. Ask them, what is the standard? When you're working with online trees or family tree software, what's the standard for naming a person? Do you put their farm name in? Do you put both names in the surname pie, uh, box? What is the standard? Um, so asking uh, specialists on that is really important. One of the things you walk away with today is that you should have my contact information um, to be able to say, hey, Lori, I don't know who to contact in this circumstance. Can you help me find out who would I, who's a specialist I should talk to? And as I mentioned, taking your time and focusing on one ancestor at a time is really important, even as you look at um, using online family trees. Big cautions <laughs> that go along with this. All the information found on these sites should be considered leads only. This is a standard across the board. Everybody believes this, okay? It's really important that you take it a step at a time, a person at a time, and look at it a fact at a time and a source at a time because you have to understand the validity of the information. Otherwise, it keeps you running down those rabbit holes from running down those rabbit holes. Hopefully, the websites, the online trees will give you documented sources. Many times it won't. And so you have to be very careful of how you are documenting this. When I've done a family tree, I have um, I do biographical sketches for my about my ancestors and I choose one person at a time. One of the first steps I do is cr to create a timeline on that person. And if I don't have any source other than an ancestry.com family tree, that is my source that I am noting. And that shows me as I read my timeline on that person that that one fact that I got from that tree needs to clar have clarification. It needs the documentation behind it. And so it creates a new to-do list for me. All right. So even if you all you have is that you found that one fact on just a uh, family tree you found on whatever site, be sure to cite that source. That website is your source. That um, person who put the, the information onto that family tree, whoever owns that family tree is your source. You want to make sure you cite that completely. So I'm going to say two statements here that kind of contradict each other. One is you put the information on the web, consider it out there forever. Even if you put it up there and you know the next day you choose to cho pull it back down, somebody has found that and has saved that information. In the same way, in the same uh, idea, if you find a website today and you didn't make note of it or copy it or scan or save anything from it, it could disappear tomorrow. <laughs> Inevitably, that's what's going to happen. And that has happened with me in both of those circumstances where I cannot get some information to, to um, be removed from the Internet totally because so many people have gotten access to it. And then also I've gone to find a website I had found two days ago and it's gone now. And so you have to consider both of those ideas may happen. Here's some more ideas to consider. <clears throat> If you submit your tree to a website, use an email address specifically for that contact. Create a, a Gmail account or a Yahoo account or Hotmail or any of those and use it specifically just for your tree you have posted on whatever website you choose to put on your tree on. That way when people contact you, it's really saving, you're, you're really focusing your work on just I'm opening that one email and seeing who has responded back to me. Contact researchers through the site, but move the correspondence to email right away. So if somebody contacts you within Ancestry.com, <clears throat> then make sure that you respond back saying, yes, I'd like to share information. It sounds like we're on the same tree. I'd like to move that to email instead. Could you please email me at dot, 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 whatever your email address is. 
So that makes it possible that you are not re relying on that website to keep track of your correspondence. I say this because Ancestry in the last six months changed how they have their messaging. And it makes me crazy because I had sorted all of my email messages or all of my messages on that site into folders. And all of a sudden those folders are gone because Ancestry did not see the need to keep them. And so all that work I'd done, I have to redo. I have to look through all those messages and get those contacts off and make sure, okay, I, these people I did do this with, I have been emailing with, but these other people I was only messaging through Ancestry. And so I have to catch up and, and fix that, that problem. Consider putting your tree on more than one site. Also check more than one site for the trees of others. The cousin who has all the answers could be on any one of these online tree sites. <laughs> it could be, you know, recently we had somebody contact my brother who also has an Ancestry account and he has the same tree I have. <clears throat> we have just have it sharing the same tree. And so he contacted me saying, hey, this one person has an account on genie.com and um, she says that she's related through this one line. And so I messaged her back and said, hey, let's let's share this outside of Ancestry and outside of Jeannie and do an email. And we were able, she was able to share photos. I had never had photos of certain ancestors and she had the photos. And so that's of course a dream come true for genealogists. And so that's important to watch for. So you're gonna look at more sites and you're gonna think about possibly putting your tree on more sites if you want to find more people and more collections. Follow the standards of the National Genealogical Society. And here are a couple of those standards on the screen here. Are sources cited? When you look at that tree, are the sources cited? When was the site last updated or when was the tree last updated on that site? Does it include current contact information? And again, keep track of that current contact information outside of the site, not just within the site. Are the directions clear to use that site? And I'll tell you, there's a lot more videos showing up on YouTube. Com. It's one of those places where you could get lost for a very long time watching video after video after video. Um, you can get on tangents that go left and right. So, um, but it's, it's important to look at, and I did watch some of these uh, on the different websites I'm going to uh, show you tonight. Is it easy to add or delete information from the tree you submit? So when you submit that tree, is it easy for you to, to edit that tree? <clears throat> now, these different sites we're going to go through tonight, some of them, their goal is to have one massive big tree that everybody connects to. And that's the, that really is their goal. They just want to have all of that. So it'd be like, you know, you know, 50 people meeting in a room saying, okay, we are all adding to the very same tree. I don't know about you guys, but in my family, that would be catastrophe <laughs> to get 50 of us to agree on what to put on that tree. And so the, the, the websites that allow you to have your own tree, not connected necessarily to other people's trees, um, those have benefits as well. So I see both ways of this. Some people do work really well when they're all um, working on the same project. And so it's, there are different ways to do this. Privacy settings are gonna be very important as you look at these websites. Some of them have much, you give you much more control than others. Um, so there could be a private tree or a public tree setting. In Ancestry, they have um, a public tree and then you have private, but you could also do an extra box, check it off to say, I want it so private, no one even knows it's here. And so people don't contact me. I don't want them to contact me right now. And, you know, <laughs> the idea of having your tree on a website doesn't always mean it's because you want to be able to share all of your research. Sometimes it's because you you travel a lot and you want that access to all of your information on, on the web so that if you didn't have a device with you to read it, you could read it on a computer at a library, for instance. Um, so there are many reasons people will do these or work with these online trees. So having it ultra private sometimes helps. Other people, I have made mine ultra private at different times when I've wanted to really step back and make sure it's as clear as I can make it, that it's as well documented as I can make it. 
And so I've made it ultra private so I don't have anyone trying to find that information and duplicating any of my mistakes. And so I've purposely made it ultra private. How easy is it to edit your tree on that site? Um, the best example I have is I had put some of my family on familysearch.org. Now they are one of those sites I'm gonna go over and they do, um, their idea is to have everybody add to the one massive tree, okay? Like we are all one big family, we're all adding to that same project. Um, the problem I had is I had entered my mother-in-law who I love dearly and I had killed her off. <laughs> Couldn't un I couldn't bring her back to life. She, the information would not fix. And so it took me a while to fix that within familysearch.org. So um, something to consider is how easy is it to, to edit that tree? How easy it to, is it to have collaborations with others? Um, you know, on a lot of these sites, you can share a tree, like on Ancestry, I can share invitations that people could see a private tree of mine, or I, I send them an invitation that they could be a collaborator, or that they could be an editor, which is really giving them a lot of power. Um, so you, you may want to look at what these different websites do for um, enhancing collaboration with other researchers. And then bells and whistles, you know how it is with any kind of product, it's whether they have all the bells and whistles, I want as many bells and whistles as possible, all these additions, I want them to be available on any device I want to pull up and um, all having to do with apps and all of these different things. I'm a low tech kind of person. I just want it very simple. I want the website to, to um, provide a, access to a timeline. I want it to create it, but I also want to be able to edit that timeline. And I want to be able to tag. <clears throat> I'm going to take a drink here real quick. With tagging, what's nice is that then you can look at that tree of 11,000 people. And if you've tagged everybody appropriately, you can just pull up those that fill any of these certain tags. Like anybody who attended college or specifically certain colleges so that you could do a, a query within the, the tree and pull anybody who fills in that that category you've decided is a category or a tag. So tagging has been come, become more important for me. These are the different websites that I'm going to highlight. I'm going to highlight most of them. There's um, three of them that I'm not going to add in this. And that's My Trees, 23andMe, and One Great Family. Um, you're definitely welcome to look at those other websites. And by the way, I don't have a handout for tonight. But if you email me, then I will send you the PDF of the slides so that you can have access to all the things that I'm covering tonight. But I will cover the Ancestry, Family Search, Genie, WikiTree, My Heritage, which actually My Heritage owns Genie, Tribal Pages, and Find My Past. Those seem to be the ones that that kind of float to the top when you have those top five, top ten kind of websites to host family trees. I think what we're going to do is. Um, at the end, I'll have a Q&A session. So any questions you come up, like uh, Bethany said, go ahead and add those to the Q&A section and I will answer those at the end. All right, so Ancestry.com. I go over that one because that is the one I have most of my family tree on. <clears throat> um, you can have your tree on Ancestry in a free account. You don't have to pay Ancestry to host your tree. Um, you do end up paying when they start showing those little leaves to say, okay, I want to, you know, be able to get access to a lot of the different collections. Um, but I'll tell you, when I first started with Ancestry, I maintained a free account, and then I ended up using the library edition um, more frequently. Uh, so, and then after a while, I decided, because I use it a lot with work and everything, I ended up paying for a, a U.S. edition. Um, so even with the World Edition, I don't pay for that. I use the Library Edition for those kinds of collections. Your tree belongs to you. You can create more than one tree. At one point, my tree was, was massive and um, Family Tree Maker was not powerful enough to handle that many people or to have it transfer in the computer that we were using. So we split it up the tree into different segments. Well, after a while then technology ended up 
working better and I needed to put all those trees back together, which was a little cumbersome. But um, you do have the ability to focus on a specific part of your tree and just name it that one part. Um, it allows you to do the tagging I mentioned and having a notes field. And I'll show you an example of that um, in a minute. The timeline is created automatically, but then also you can edit that and add more things to it. And as I said, the goal for me, and it's important for you to think of what is your end goal here? Is it just to do the research or are you trying to come up with a product that's going to work to share all those stories? Um, with me, I came up with the plan that I'm going to write biographical sketches and the timeline aspect of that is so vital. It's so important to how I organize um, the data and then be able to tell the story from that timeline. So having that timeline on Ancestry has helped a lot and being able to edit it. It also links you, the family tree links you to your DNA matches if you have done DNA testing on Ancestry. A couple of the other websites do that as well. Um, I am not going to go into great detail of how you can take your DNA matches from one site and upload them to another site. That's not what is being covered tonight, but that is a possibility. So if you are interested in that, you can contact me at a later date um, and we can talk about that. Uh, also on Ancestry, I find it very easy to edit the data names, dates, places, you know, all of that. To remove duplications is very simple as well. And then relationships. <clears throat> they have a lot of different um, uh, categories of relationships. And as we know, there are a lot of relationships that people have had over time. <laughs> and so it's not always, you know, a sibling. It could be a half sibling. It could be a stepson, a stepdaughter, all of those. It could be that um, a couple never got married, that they're more of a partner or a uh, mother and a father or a stepmother. And so there's so many categories. And Ancestry has done very well, I believe, in identifying that and making it possible for you to um, tag them or to designate that relationship. What I did have noticed is that doesn't change how it's showing up on the screen, on the actual profile page. It still shows up as spouse, even though if you were to pull it up, it's, you know, it's not spouse, it's partner, something like that. So <clears throat> here's an example of what a family tree looks like on Ancestry. And you can notice up here um, where the larger arrow is, you can choose what kind of um, display you want. I prefer the pedigree display. I don't like the other direction because it adds the siblings and it becomes so massive on the screen that it's hard for me to navigate in there. So I always choose the that one pedigree format. And then uh, by the smaller arrow, you see there's a blue dot and that is explaining um, the connections that you have through lines. And that's based on the DNA matches that your ancestry or your um, DNA matches portion of ancestry would show. So that's connecting it to your family tree. Now, one point to make when you have a family tree and you have it um, split up in different trees, then you have to choose one of those to connect through the DNA matches. Um, so it's important. That was another reason why I brought it all together back into one massive tree for my own ancestry. This is a profile page. And so you can see it has a timeline on the left side. This fax is a timeline and it has there, you could filter, but you can add information to that timeline. And for this person, Oscar Briggs James, I add a lot of newspaper clippings um, for a variety of, of events that happened in his life. Those newspapers were not digitized. It was all um, clippings that I found off of the microfilm, scanned them, and then you know, added the data into this timeline. And so that made that timeline a lot more thorough, a lot fuller. Um, where this next arrow is, this thin one in the middle, it has attended college. That's one of those tags that I came up with so that I could actually go in and search this tree by that tag saying attended college and pull up anybody I put in that they it says they attended college. I could actually create another tag and say, say okay, I just want to know the ones that attended college at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. And I would have some of my siblings, myself, as well as my grandmother and 
her father, Oscar Briggs James, all attended the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And so you could pull up and find some really interesting stories, you know, along with that. The second arrow here in the center <coughs> mentions or lists the life story. We're on facts, but the life story takes those facts and puts it in, um, in a storyline. Um, so it kind of tells the story for you. Uh, and then next to that is gallery in the center, and then hints. So gallery is a great place to put your digital images of your photos and of your um, documents. And that's a great place to share those documents then with the other researchers, understanding once you place them there, they're going to stay there. Okay, just understand that. All this research as well, when you're sharing your tree online, um, any costs that you have accrued from all those years of research, you're, you're sharing this, okay? It's out there for free for people to use. You can ask them to give you credit, but I, realistically, it's not, it's not gonna happen, <laughs> not very well. So there are very respectful people out there, but there are a lot of people who are just taking as well. And so you have to be ready for that and be, if you feel like that would be a waste of your investment that you've put in, then I would say don't put all of that information into the tree. Okay, you can choose how much you add. On the, the right side here, where the bigger arrow is, these notes actually came from Family Tree Maker. Um, when we, my mother and I started using Family Tree software, we started with Family Tree Maker. And then I took that GEDCOM file and I uploaded it to Ancestry. And that's why those notes actually transferred into the notes field here as well. Again, on Ancestry, you have these tree settings, <clears throat> tree info for tree name in the top here. I actually got an, a suggestion from Thomas McKente to put in the word unsourced because I still think of my tree as needing work. I needed, and I put a description in here too. It says, I took my tree off Ancestry one winter and I'm trying to rebuild it now with citations. Have patience with me and let me know if you have any questions. I have placed a check mark next to the profile um, page of each person I have verified, okay? So if you remember on the previous screens, next to each person's name, instead of a photo of the person, I put a green check mark. And I, all I did was got it, I had a, um, uh, an icon that I got off some website. And um, so I was able to put that in as a, a, as a photo, a JPEG, and that became the, the um, profile page profile picture that got included. So um, also here, there's other settings that you can put in there, automatically build stories for this tree. Um, it'll uh, create stories for events shown in a person's life story. So I can uncheck that if I don't want them to be bothering with that, I can uncheck that. Over on the, the side here in the top, you have um, tree info privacy settings you'll go into to set it if it's a public tree or a private tree and then sharing um, there's a section on where you're going to share that information okay and down here it says manage your tree you can export that tree you can even delete it off of ancestry so that it's gone after that um, and i mentioned how someone has already grabbed the information you already have it out there for a short time. Someone's grabbing that information. So make sure that your information is as tight as you can make it um, on there. Family search. Now, <laughs> Ancestry would have been a whole hour by itself. Family search is a whole hour by itself. Um, but we're going to kind of touch the, the, um, the basics of each of these sites. Family search is run by the Genealogical Society of Utah, the Latter-day Saints. It's, they create a free account. It's very easy. They don't sell their, the information. I've never been bothered by any um, extra notification from that organization. Their goal is to have one massive family tree where everyone contributes to one tree instead of all these separate ones. And so everybody's in that same room adding all the information. Each profile page is shared as well. So someone can go into your profile page or in your tree and change something. And that in itself kind of killed the deal for me. 
everybody has to decide this on their own though. I've heard of very good success stories by people who have their full tree on family search and they've had a lot of luck sharing with a lot of people. And it's worked out very well with cor correspondence of people saying, I, I have the correct information. This is what I'm basing it on. And that's been great. There have also been people who have said, no, I, they have it wrong and they won't change it. And so that's been difficult. Um, it's also, like I said, it's difficult sometimes to remove or edit someone. And so that part might have gotten better in the last 12 months. They've been working very hard on this site to make it more um, user friendly. Here's an example of what a family tree looks like on Ancestor or on Family Search. You can see at the top it says family tree. That's where you choose, and then um, overview or tree or person. In this area, I think often what happens with us is we don't realize the different um, little options we have throughout the page. We're focusing on the names and everything. Up in the um, left corner, it says landscape. That's a drop down menu. You can choose how you're going to view this information. And it gives you more than one or two options here. So just consider using those drop down menus when you see them just to see what they're about. Um, in this case, I have Mary Adeline Addie McPherson that I'm going to pull up. I pro pull up her profile page and right away, I noticed Mary Adeline Addie McPherson was not how I had added that information. Down here where it says latest changes by the red arrow, the red arrows, by the way, I had put on these slides so they don't show up on, on the actual websites. But the name had been changed on January 14th of 2021, just this year. And it gives me the name of the person who did that. Now, my problem is, is I entered Mary Adeline McPherson on purpose. I kept Addie out because lower down on the screen, that's where I found it more important to place her nickname in there. So as an alternative name. <clears throat> so again, it's it's another person looking at something saying, I'd rather have it see it, say it this way. And after 40 years of research, I'm kind of protective of what I, I have chosen to do with my tree. Um, so that's why I don't have a lot of people on a tree on Family Search. But I'll tell you, I do use Family Search to find other researchers who do have some of these people on their tree. And then I will contact that person. Um, so with Chris Marie Tabor, I will contact her and say, hey, I see that you have been working on that tree um, on that profile page. Uh, how about if we talk outside on Ancest or on uh, Gmail or on Yahoo or email of some sort and see, I've even met now with people th via Zoom. It's been a lot easier for all of us. You get a Zoom account and you have a meeting and you can meet with these people. It's so wonderful. I wonder how many of you have made use of that. And then by the second arrow here, <clears throat> There are different tools that you can use, possible duplicates, um, find similar people, merge by ID. So if you have you know, two different profile pages, it's really the same person, you can merge. You can report abuse. I have not heard of anyone having to report abuse. Um, I'm not sure if anyone in the audience has had that issue as well. Um, and then delete person unavailable. So um, it's, that's where I say it's very difficult to get rid of a person or to fix a person's page sometimes. And then of course to print. Now I have 11,000 people on my tree. I'm not gonna find an easy way to print that. Um, so if you have a smaller tree or you wanna focus on it um, a couple generations by itself, then you can print in these different kinds of formats. If you see here, um, I do have, I still feel that, that a lot of the trees on Family Search have um, gotten a bad rep <laughs> over the years. Um, and some of it is that it wasn't always verified by other people. And so the information just stayed there for a long time. This is a, a page for uh, the lower part for Mary, McFer Mary Adeline McPherson. That's my grandmother. So I knew who all of her children were. And if you look at the top, the first star here, Johanna, Eloise Torsky. Actually, Johanna and Eloise are two women. <laughs> They're two sisters. And so Eloise is not even listed separately, and she is alive. Johanna, Johanna did die. Aunt Jo did die. Um, and then you look lower to the second star item, Gerald G. Torsky. That's my Uncle Jerry, and he's, he's very much alive. <laughs> he's definitely alive. I talk to him quite often. He's in Nebraska, and I'm in Wisconsin. So there's some misinformation in here 
And it's it ended up to be a lot of these pages had errors to them. I have to decide, is it important enough for me to go in and make all those corrections? Because that's a huge project. And I, I need to decide, is that important or not? That's what you have to decide too, is to say, how much time do I have to fix other people's um, errors in those pages? Um, so that's something to consider. It, there's no right answer here, in other words. Uh, and then also, uh, one of the sources, it said under Mary Adeline, I, I pulled up sources, and it had Mary Rice, whose husband is Patrick Rice. Now, Mary Rice is, whoops, Mary Rice is my sister. <clears throat> and she should be added as Mary Johanna Cook. That was her maiden name. And, and we always put in women under their maiden name. Also, it lists her father as George Henry Bork. He is the first name on the page in the newspaper of all the obituaries the day my mom's obituary showed up in the newspaper. You notice in blue, this record was indexed by a computer. There may be errors. To me, that, that's not a good way to do things. They shouldn't have a product out there or a source out there that is has such blatant errors to it. And it's not because I'm protective of my sister. She can protect herself. But it's the idea that many people out there are going to look at this and say, wow, maybe she had a different father and not realize what her real maiden name is. And they're down that rabbit hole. And they are completely confused because they're not noticing that small print at the top. And they're just going for the, the, the information that's showing up on the, the lower part of the page. Now, Family Search does this part very well. I like this part, the gallery, where you can upload documents. There are many parts of this that are really good. Now, if you see on that first item, it's a newspaper. <clears throat> this is what shows up. Now, I mentioned how on Family Search you can't make anything private. That's not true. You can make this one part private. The items that are in your gallery, you can either uh, make them public or private and re reduce how many people have access to that item. And to me, that's that's important in a way because you want to make sure that this is fully documented and then make it public. Uh, it allows you, it keeps you kind of honest with that. Um, and then also you can identify who is uh, who is in this memory. You can attach this document to whoever is in there. And often, as we all know, one document could be having you know five to ten people that it is is associated with. And so you want to be able to uh, attach that to more than one person. <clears throat> this is another type. This is a, a story that you I actually typed it in. I entered it in the website. And it's the story of um, where I believe my grandmother on my dad's side, where her name came from. Because it's a very um, unique spelling of the name Adeline. I had two grandmothers named Adeline. Adeline. And so Adeline came from the name of a maternal cousin. Wilder is a surname of Adeline's ma maternal grandmother. Her name was Adeline Wilder James. Adeline was known as Jimmy to many friends and family. To her sisters, she was always called sister. She was the middle of, of two sisters, and I was the middle of two sisters too. So I've always had a connection to my, my grandma Jimmy. <clears throat> she died before I was born, but before all, let's see, she only knew my two oldest brothers. She didn't get to know the four youngest children <laughs> of the family. And so, and then I note in here, this is an undocumented conclusion. Understand reader, this is where I'm basing this from. And then I can, like I said, I can attach it to belong to her memory in the, within the tree. Genie.com. Now, genie.com was pretty popular a couple of years ago, it got owned or uh, purchased in 2012, I believe it was, by MyHeritage. And they have built it up. Um, and thank goodness they kept it as its own entity as well. Uh, it's very popular, fairly pro popular and growing as we're as it's going. You own a, your own tree, but you can merge it into one big tree as well. Uh, the basic subscri subscription is free. Um, so you can do a lot with a free part of the subscription when it deals with just putting your tree on there. Um, it does have alerts for inconsistencies. And so if you have a child of a girl of five having a baby, 
it'll catch that kind of thing because of the dates and math. <laughs> so, uh, and then I'm, it's pretty impressive what kind of privacy settings they have. And you'll see that in a minute. So this is what their family tree looks like. And one of the reasons I got into this more frequently or more recently was that cousin who had ended up having photos of um, ancestors we never had seen photos of. And so that was exciting to connect to her. Plus she had a lot of connections living connections back in Norway. And so that communication that she had built up over years, she was then able to share with my brother and I. And so we have more contacts back in the old country. And that's incredibly important, isn't it, when you're dealing with the old country. So you can see how the, the page looks. One of the aspects of finding the right place to put your family tree is visually, does it look the way you want it to look? Is it nice? So this is what a profile page looks like. And Connie Olson Streeter is that cousin. And I did have a, a Zoom meeting with her. She lives in Nebraska still. Um, so it was, it was just really fun to meet with her and talk to her about what her goals are. And um, we actually had letters that then we could send out to her that were written by her direct ancestors. And she had photos of um, direct ancestors of ours. And you can see added by and then managed by. And so you have Connie, but I also have Eric Overson and then uh, four other people that I can then contact within genie.com and in their messaging. And then e when I message them, say, let's talk on, on uh, either by Zoom or um, let's talk through email instead. <clears throat> Again, another item in, in the uh, genie profile page is a timeline and you can add you can see up in the top corner here add a new event so it does give you that kind of control the way you do on on ancestry what's nice about this one is that you can check off the ones that you want just um, these certain types of categories in the timeline so that it could be including more than just one person and it's just saying all the births or all the weddings or whatever and this is Connie's profile page. It mentions she's uploaded 151 either documents or um, images like photos uh, that she's uploaded to her tree. And then it's this is where I would send a message to her. And I wanted to point out this one because it, with her, she didn't have any <laughs> inconsistencies, but I did find one way, way back in the 1600s. Um, it mentions that this one inconsistency, if I click on that, it tells me that um, the name of a child was not lining up properly uh, compared to the other information in the, the tree that was put in. So it kind of explains what that inconsistency is. And then I can contact the profile managers in that same space and say, well, I might have an answer for that you know. <clears throat> and then this one shows all of those profile privacy options that you have. You can make some, each part of these that are on this list, you can make either private or public. And so you have a lot of control here as to what information is going to become available. Wikitree is pretty popular as well. Now, one of the things I do with websites is I do what is called the Frink Torsky test. And that is that those are two names, one on my mom's side and one on my dad's side, that are fairly unique. Usually it's a good test of how complete is this website that claims to be so complete. And I do this with family trees online because I wanna see how many actually have that massive a database brand um, amount that would include even the Franks or the Torskis. <clears throat> Wikitree didn't do too well <laughs> on my lines. So I finally did find an example, but it took a while to find it. Um, what I would say about Wikitree, and the reason I, I didn't give you the list typed out, it's on their front page. I, I really appreciate how well, how easy it is to read Wikitree's instructions. <clears throat> so it says the free family tree, so it is free. Together we're growing an accurate single family tree again. Okay, that's still someone else's, you know, everybody's coming in together with this using DNA and traditional genealogical sources. Now, all of these hyperlinks that you see in the, the statements here all go to more information. <clears throat> Privacy controls enable us to integrate modern family history. Extraordinary protections ensure that our shared tree will never be lost. This is a very, very active kind of group of people who are working with um, editing and researching 
um, all the people in this massive tree. They're very active. And so uh, one of the other things that they say is 100% free, including many benefits for genealogists who sign our honor code. One of those free services is working with professional genealogists who can possibly help with the resources that are near them to help understand uh, the families that are in the, the region they're from. So you get, you're having a lot more accessibility to information here. So here's my example, Asa Soper Briggs Jr. <clears throat> now, the part of, that's really cool for me, this is, again, I don't have my tree on WikiTree. This is an example where you're going into a website to look to see what trees are already in that website. So is, your, is Asa your ancestor? It says, please don't go away, log in to collaborate or comment or ask our community of genealogists the question. And so they're really encouraging all of us to participate in this, this massive project. As I said, Family Search is doing the same thing. It's just a different um, way to look at it. Sorry about the dog, that's our next door neighbor's dog. <laughs> um, another, if you look lower down on that profile page, you'll see that the sources, I, I really appreciate how Wikitree does their sourcing. And so they create these citations that are pretty nicely written. Um, now, the, the citations on Ancestry are pretty good, but I just feel like they do a better job here on Wikitree. Uh, and then also the document you can see off to the right, that's a document I could download to my, um, to my external hard drive where I keep all the, the documents I've created for different people. I can save that to my external hard drive. I don't have to rely on being able to remember, was that on the Wikitree site or maybe that was an Ancestry tree? You know, instead, I'm gathering everything I can. My heritage, also very up and coming. <clears throat> you can import your GEDCOM file right onto their website. It is subscription based, and I hit that paywall pretty quickly in the, the testing I did. Many, many, many bells and whistles. This is a very active group. I don't know if you've had anyone speak about my heritage, but it is an hour by itself. One of the interesting things they, they've done recently is to have photo enhancement so that you can ha take a photo and you can actually have the person's head in the photo move, which to me is just kind of creepy, but it, it is kind of interesting at the same time. So they have bells and whistles like that, lots of apps and tools to use. They also have a lot of how-to videos on YouTube and then webinars that they provide through Legacy Family Tree webinars. Um, so if you have not looked at web, uh, Legacy Family Tree webinars, $50 for the year, at least they, that's a deal they had in two, 2020, um, and you have access to their whole library of years of webinars. And so um, my heritage has put a lot of webinars out there on how to get the most out of the trees that are on there as well as the collections. And also they do DNA matching. So something to con consider as well. This is what their front page looks like. So build your family tree to, to make fascinating discoveries. You can import the GEDCOM or you can create the tree, which is just basically answering some questions and, and then it creates the tree and you start adding data. This is the test I did, the Frank Torsky test. So I did it for Calvin Frank. I knew he died in Wisconsin or in Minnesota rather in the 1880s in, um, and that he had lived in Minnesota for quite a long time. Calvin Frank is one of my favorite ancestors to look into. And so um, I find that he shows up on my heritage family trees on the Freeman Mills family site and the Wooters fam website. And it shows who they're managed by. And so if I subscribe to this, then I can go ahead and uh, contact those people who maintain those websites that include Calvin Frank. The goal there for me would be to looking for more documents and possibly photos. I have one photo of the man and he's very interesting looking. So I, I really need to find a few more photos and, and draw out some more of his story through documents that these researchers may have. The assumption when you're working with any family trees that are online is that the owner of that tree has not put everything on there that they have on each person of the family. And so it's always worth contacting. And it may take two or three times of contacting. I don't know if you've looked at some of these sites, it'll say when the, you know, tell you when was that person back last on their website. And it could be six to three to six months ago. 
it's still worth time, your time looking at how to contact that person and especially to get them a contact out of G out of um, on onto email is a good way to do it. This is explains their their costs for my heritage. Um, this is the point I'm making here on here is that you can, uh, many of these websites, you can subscribe a month at a time and just pay that that one fee and then cancel your subscription and then go back to it again at a different time when you know for sure you can put that full month into your research. Um, this time of year, I'm hearing from a lot of people, no, I can't. There's gardening. I got to do my gardening, <laughs> you know, and then in the summer, oh, there's those trips, you know, and then the school starts up in the fall and and pretty soon it's uh, January, February. Maybe that's the time. That'll be the time I can make sure all my notes are in are in order. I can know for sure where are my dead ends that I need to find. Then I can go subscribe to my heritage and get the most out of all the trees that could include my people. And so um, WikiTree and Family Search, I could be doing that any time of the year because they're free. But my heritage, I have to kind of calendar that to make sure I can make the most out of the money that it's going to cost. Find my past is another up and coming one. Now in the past, they used to mostly um, have uh, British Isles. And so now in the last five years, they've really built up the connection to the United States as well. Any families in the United States. Plus they do DNA matching. Um, you can import your GEDCOM file or start your tree. Pretty simple, straightforward. This is what a tree looks like. Um, it's not as fancy as some of the other websites. It's It definitely has its own kind of look. And you can see off to the left, you have a profile. And you can then view the full profile page. It does give you a timeline. And you can go in to add information to that timeline by going under facts and events. They have these tabs in the middle. Facts and events, relations, media is where you would probably, it's also known as gallery in these other websites. That's where you're going to put the digital image of things, of uh, items that you have, photos or documents. They have a lot of articles on their blog. And this part of their website explains about um, these different articles that will help you understand how to use their website to connect to other people through their trees. And so it's important to look through all of these articles. And sometimes these websites will also have, and Ancestry is a good example of this, they'll have a whole slew of videos to watch. I'm a very visual person in my learning. And so I, I really do appreciate um, videos sometimes more than the lengthy blogs. <laughs> so although blogs are nice for reference um, material as well, certain paragraphs if they, they work it well. So tribal pages. I was so happy to find that that was still going <laughs> because I had heard of this. I, it's got to be at least 20 years ago, 25 years ago, that they had started tribal pages. And so you can see from the, their front page, they have um, articles on the security and the privacy of their collections or their of their information. The way you can have access to charts and reports, how you can publish and share your family stories and customize customized newsletters. Um, so those were very exciting. And then multiple devices. You and invited family members can download the mobile app, uh, get birthday reminders, which is kind of fun. My mom used to do the calendars where she'd write all, all the dates out and, and do it like 10 or 15 times for each of these different calendars. And um, now it's so automated, it's really great what these different sites will do. But Tribal Pages is another exciting one. This is um, an example of their page that it would show a family tree on. Um, so again, it's just kind of visually, is that what fits with what you're aiming toward? And then this is the breakdown of what their costs are and what kinds of um, uh, privileges you get with each of these different costs, the free, the premium, or the deluxe. And they're not terribly expensive, $3 a month, $4 a month, um, billed annually. So now the, the last one I'm going to cover is one of the best finds. And I really encourage you to try this as well. And that is to Google it. So you search, I wouldn't do this with the James family or the Smith family or any of those common names. But with the Bessler family, I was able to find some information this way. So you search by unique name, an era, and a location. Try various combinations of data. It, like any search that you're doing, when you put in a name of someone, don't fill in every single box, right? It's the same when you Google. If you can stay kind of broad 
if you put parentheses or uh, quotation marks around things, that's going to limit more about how much you can find. And so try different combinations. Try to save all the information you find, though, also because these sites you find may not be there the next time you look. And that's what happened to me. And I was happy to find out they reinstated the part, this one website I found them in. So I put in the name Anna Bessler Gerwing. My husband's family had notes saying this was a sister of a great, great grandfather of my, or I think it was three greats back of my husband. And we knew that she had married a Gerwing. So I put in Anna Bessler Gerwing, or I'm sorry, Bess, yeah, not Gerwing, but Wessling, Wessling. And so right away it came up with WikiTree, had some, um, some trees on there that had included her. Genie.com also did. Ancestry UK had it, her listed. And then the last one down there, My Heritage, the second from the last caught my eye. I don't know if you do this when you do Google search, if you check out what websites are coming up before just clicking on the blue hyperlink, check to see what website is it that it's directing you to. <clears throat> I was so happy this came back. <laughs> I was so worried it had gotten lost. And now because I found it the other day, I need to go in there and just copy everything I see and just make sure I, I walk away with all the information. One of the things I definitely wanted to check is I want to make sure I have a copy of this photo. This is the tiny log house at Lake Lenore, Saskatchewan, Canada that was inhabited by 13 Gerwings in the winter of 1903 and 1904. It has been preserved by the local community as a tribute to Canadian pioneers. And there's more of an article there too. I'll have you know, <laughs> looking at who the composed the family at that point, it was Anna and all the rest of them were men. <laughs> so that's a very small house. <laughs> so it would be very interesting. I wish that I knew what was going through Anna's life at that time when she was stuck in that little house with all those guys. So, and I think the youngest one was probably a teenager. So it was all, old, you know, older guys doing this stuff. So, all right, time for Q&A. I know that's quite a lot of information. So we don't currently have any questions. I did have one person that had commented that they use the fam they use Family Search and they didn't have any issues with um, fixing living to deceased or anything like that. Awesome. Uh -huh. Yeah, it would be interesting if people would type in in the chat or Q&A um, what websites they have used for posting their family trees. And then also if you use more than one. So we're just going to wait a few minutes here to see if anybody has any questions. As I mentioned, we didn't really have any during, just the one comment. Um, mm -hmm. But I recognize sometimes people are typing while I talk. And then I'll be like, well, I guess we're done for the night. And then there's a question. Yeah. <laughs> so we had Jay Dalkey say that Ancestry is so far so good. So that must be what they are using. Mm -hmm. Well, you have a cat too. I do. <laughs> we have two cats. One is in the room with me sleeping on a beanbag of some sort and the other one is banished from the room because <laughs> he's <laughs> gonna be too ambitious she spends most of her time uh aside but now that i am talking she wants to be a part <laughs> of it oh yeah margaret uses ancestry find my past my heritage and family search wow yeah that's a lot to keep up with too it is nice. Most of them, I think, actually send emails when they have updates. Um, plus, people will comment, you know, uh, send. I guess when they send a, another person sends a message, that person who owns the tree will get a message through email to say, listen, there's been activity. So <laughs> Don has some work to do. <laughs> oh, thanks for joining, Don. So it's Margaret followed up and said that Ancestry is the main one they use. The others are much smaller trees. So, yep. Yeah. 
Well, I'll wait just a moment longer. Um, I think, many times I think we've overwhelmed them. <laughs> so. I wouldn't be surprised. I really like making sure people know they can always reach out. Yes. Um, and actually, I'll put, um, I don't know, if people want the, um, the presentation, then they can, I'll put it in the chat what my email is here. It's a horrible sentence. I, I put the, my email address in the chat box. Um, additionally, if you don't get it or you lose it or anything, you can always talk, contact the library. They will know if you don't get a hold of me directly, they will know to direct you to me and then I can connect you with Lori or help you as well. Additionally, Lori is an amazing uh, resource to be able to reach out on that much background on this. You cannot go wrong, but our library, we have a lot of people at our adult information desk that are also able to get you started as well. So we can oh, see if we can help you from there. But, you know, Lori has commented many things that if you need further help, she would be able to help you with. So I would take advantage of that resource. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Kirsten uh, uh, uses Family Search and Ancestry on Family Search. Uh, they spend a lot of time cleaning up duplicates and finding sources for unsourced info added from another user. Mm -hmm. Made the decision, as Lori was commenting earlier, to do some cleaning. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's definitely a project. And if that's something that you end up putting your time into, that is also super helpful for, for people out there. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Especially when it is on... Um, those free websites that are the more accessible places where people are starting out. So hopefully right. they are, don't start digging into incorrect information. Yeah. yeah. Getting down those rabbit holes. Yeah. There's so, a, yeah. Jay Dalkey says talk was perfect for the restart spot. I'm at, I'm always at a restart spot by the way. <laughs> uh, so 12 years ago started and ended going at it two winters now to renew Wonderful stuff. Now making it easier. Good. That's good to hear. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to give it one more moment. We'll probably have a couple more things trickle in, but if we don't, we will call it an evening. There's still a little bit of nice weather. We might need to go out there and get a quick yeah. little walk in. Oh, it is still light out. <laughs> it is. It, we are clearly heading into summer at this point. Yes. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this weekend because all the trees in this area are really starting to uh, leaf out with all their buds and all of the leaves. So I'm looking mm. forward to enjoying some green. My soul needs oh, green so bad. Yes. yes. No, I, <laughs> well, I fully agree. Well, I don't see any other.